that was you what I asked. Thank you. We're going to start. Um, my name is Irina Ansa. I'm with the Yale Law School Student and Legal Defense Fund, and I'm introducing the speakers today and moderating the panel. Uh, we have TJ Tomas here. He is a manager of investigations at the Animal Legal Defense Fund. There he recruits, trains, and supports ALDF's undercover investigators who document evidence, prepare cases, and conduct research on animal cruelty. He oversees all aspects of undercover investigations there and creates and supports a network for investigators in the field. Before coming to, to ALDF, TJ worked as an undercover investigator for Mercy for Animals and PETA in 30 states and in many industries in which animals are exploited and abused. One of his well-known successes brought about the first felony conviction for cruelty to factory farm animals in the U.S. after he did an investigation for PETA that exposed abusive conditions at the largest turkey operation in the world in 2008. Um, <laughs> Justin Marceau. Justin is an associate professor at the University of Denver Sturm College of Law and is of counsel in the litigation program at the Animal Legal Defense Fund. At ALDF, he works on a variety of <coughs> civil cases, specializing in constitutional and civil uh, constitutional matters. At the law school, he teaches criminal law and procedure, constitutional law, and animal law. Before joining ALDF, Justin clerked on the Ninth Circuit for Sidney R. Thomas, worked in the litigation as a litigation associate at a large law firm in San Francisco, and served as assistant federal public defender. Please welcome the panel. Okay, so I um, I did have a, a presentation ready that uh, I was gonna gonna show to everybody here in a, in a speech and everything that went along with it, but after sort of hearing the discussion um, of, of the people here and seeing some of the presentations earlier and um, hearing what people were talking about, I sort of, I sort of changed my mind. Um, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going I'm to talk to you guys from the heart a little bit more here. Um, and I guarantee you that this is going to be uh, tough for you to hear. Um, but however hard that is, uh, trust when I say it is much harder for me. Um, and I, I, I've got to apologize. I'm sorry that this, that this is after lunch. Um, <laughs> the, all the statistics that we hear, all of the discussion of water and air and other types of pollution, all of the confinement issues that we hear about, all, all of these you know, different ways to analyze what humans are doing to animals, it, it's, it's all daunting and it's all horrible, right? We, we understand these statistics that we hear. Um, but there's something of a disconnect between the statistics and the reality. And I'm one of few people who can stand before you and say that I have seen this reality for myself. And I have experienced this reality in ways that most people can't imagine. Right? Now that's a phrase. People say, I can't imagine X. They say that all the time. I can't imagine whatever it is. And I'm here to tell you that, that when it comes to animal agriculture, you literally cannot imagine. Think about those words. There is no way for your imagination to frame the reality that they experience. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that reality because, because at the end of the day, that's why we are here. The reality of their suffering is what makes us all want to learn about 
advocate for, and in, in a lot of your cases work in law around animal issues. So I'm going to go through a few industries. I'm going to go through a few cases that I worked and explain the horror of that reality in a very real way. The first time that I walked into a slaughterhouse, I could not have been prepared. I had seen tons of footage of investigations. I would watched Earthlings, a documentary film, feature length, that demonstrates the five ways that human beings exploit animals. I thought I knew, I thought I knew what I was in for. The reality, however, was very, very different. The room is completely dark when you live hang chickens. This is because chickens are flight animals. They're scared and they try to fly away or run away from you. So the room being dark makes them less likely to run. You have this immense sound of the chain line and the conveyor belt and the machinery and, and it's deafening. You have to wear earplugs. All of these animal agriculture facilities are so loud that it is required by law that the workers there wear earplugs. And many of them, as they're tested year after year, their hearing is gone, even with ear protection. And the animals have none. The chickens are poured out of cages onto a conveyor belt that comes into the facility from one side. And they're hung by men standing at this conveyor belt on a chain with shackles going by in the opposite direction. Each man, roughly 10 or 12 of them on the assembly line, each man has to pick up, find the legs of a chicken, invert them, and hang them in the shackles in the dark. And when I walked into that room for the first time, and I experienced that for the first time, it took my breath away. And there was a part of me that never left that room. Because that horror is beyond what any video or any slide, any presentation, or any amount of words can describe. And those men stand there and they hang those birds on that assembly line. One bird, every 1.7 seconds for eight hours, times two shifts every day. That's horror like no movie can convey. And it doesn't stop with chickens. We do it to cows and pigs and sheep and goats and every other kind of animal that is profitable for us to do it to. The cows at JBS Swift in Colorado, in Greeley, right in, right in his backyard. When they're going down the chute into that plant, as they're walking in, they see what's happening in front of them, and they're crying. Tears as real as yours and mine. Because they see and they know that they're about to die. And there's no end to this. We cut their tails off. We cut their beaks off, their, their, their toes, the ends of their feet, their, um, their teeth, their ears, their horns, their genitals. We mutilate these animals in ways that are unimaginable 
by the definition of the word unimaginable. It is not within us to imagine this kind of horror in reality. Okay? I know this because I've done it. Not only have I seen it, when you're an investigator, you go in there and you have to do a job. And you don't have any control over what that job is. One of the presentations earlier was talking about greenwashing and selling us products and saying that these things like cage-free and free-range and grass-fed are nice. And the, the presenter was, was very accurate in saying that they're selling points, that it's propaganda. I, I don't remember the exact wording, but it was something along those lines. That is, to me, one of the most abusive examples of the depravity of human beings. To try to convey to us that there is any kind way to do these things to animals. That it's nice in some way to exploit them. To torture them. <clears throat> the pigs that I worked with at Christensen Farms in Minnesota were um, another example. They, um, they, they display even more personality than a lot of other animals because of their level of intelligence in terms of what we think of as intelligence similar to our own. And, and they are very intelligent in ways that uh, in ways that are similar to us. And we we, we had to um, castrate them with no anesthetics, right? And these are more, this is more terminology, right? Well, what, what, what do these terms mean? We talk about these things in animal law, and in animal rights, and in animal advocacy, and we, we have these terms that we use. But what it really means is torture. Understand that. I can tell you that it's not humane, or kind, or better, or we're, we're in no way being generous to them by being kind to them before we send them to the slaughterhouse. What we're doing is torturing them. I know because I've done it. And people want to say that investigators are brave and heroic and compassionate and these things in many cases are true. It takes a certain amount of personal strength to do that. <clears throat> job, to be an investigator, to, to videotape these things, to show others. But the reality is, there's not a day that goes by that I don't feel guilty for having done what I did. Because there is no amount of justification for torturing someone else. It doesn't matter who that someone is. And I can stand before you plainly and tell you that. I know it's torture because I did it. Well, what, is, what does all this mean? What does all this mean? The, the depth to which I want to disassociate our terms that we use from this reality that they experience. Well, here's why. I feel, like, I feel like most of us here, if not all of us, are vegan or at least vegetarian or animal advocates in the very least. I, I, I hope so. And if you, just, if you just simply want to learn more, then I applaud you for being here. But here, here's why I wanted to change my presentation. Here's why I wanted to tell you all this. There is no measure 
for the amount of good that we do in this world. We were having a discussion at lunch about the uh, state of our government and the lack of protection for animals after the presentation. And it comes to my mind that things are bleak and dismal and it can be very negative to feel that way and to think that way and to see things from that perspective. <laughs> but when it comes to the experience of torture that animals go through, what we are doing by advocating for them has no measure. No money, you can't, you can't win it, you can't buy it. There is no amount of value that you can place on reducing the suffering of another being. It's priceless. Another term that we use in our society all the time is something being a means to an end. It's a means to an end. My job is a means to an end, right? To make money so I can do other things that I want to do. To reduce the suffering of other living beings is an end in and of itself. We gain nothing for ourselves by doing it. They have everything to gain and we have nothing to lose. Because after that moment, it doesn't matter what happens in that being's life. While they were alive, they suffered less. And they suffered less because of our kindness and our compassion and our advocacy. And that is priceless. For them, it is priceless beyond measure. Even if they don't know it in logical terms, in you know, human language, what they experience was less suffering. And that's perfect. And so what I want to what I want to do with a group of advocates like this is encourage you. I want you to be encouraged that every moment you spend, every conversation with you have, and if you're going into animal law, every second that you spend working on those laws, on those cases, preparing them, filing them, fighting those battles on behalf of animals, it's priceless. Because their suffering matters so much to them. And I can't say that plainly enough. Because I've seen it and I've inflicted it on them myself. And there is no way that anything that we do <laughs> to advocate for them will ever be enough until it ends. And just as we were talking about at lunch, um, there, uh, a very famous quote comes to my mind. Leonardo da Vinci said, there will come a day when men such as I look upon the murder of animals the way that we now look upon the murder of men. And that day, because you all are here today, that day is now. And I agree that there aren't enough of us who feel this way, who think this way. I agree that there's not enough protection, that there's not enough time, that there's not enough land, there's not enough water, there's not enough air, that our resources are minimal, that the numbers of animals who suffer are immense, beyond measure. But the days in which they are suffering are becoming fewer and fewer because of our work. It is imperative 
beyond measure that we continue to do it on every front, in every facet, in every way possible, we must continue to fight these battles, to stand up every chance we get. Because if it was us in their place, if it was you in the cage, if it was your family, if it was your child, if it was your friend or your loved one, Nothing would be out of question. Nothing would be enough, and nothing would be too far. Our work as, as advocates should be calculated and careful and precise and well-planned and whatever that means for you that's fantastic I'm not here to tell you what kind of activist or advocate to be I'm here to tell you why it's so important to continue to do it and you'll hear from from other speakers on on, on, on ways to do that and things that ALDF does to, to promote that advocacy through the law. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody knows the reality of why it's so important to continue to do it however you, however you think is most suitable for you. So that's what I wanted to say today. Thank you. summary judgment hearing um, and it will be in the District Court of Idaho and uh, you know I'm going to argue and I have every expectation that we will, we will win uh, and we'll move on from there um, but you know these are we're, we're on the we're on the offensive but I think the starting point that I want to make is, is sort of the why right why, why did we get here and some of this came out in the keynote uh, address at lunch with Professor Pesuto this uh, custom practice policy of uh, secrecy and where does it come from? Why do we have it? Um, I, you know, I have thought about this and read lots of things, but I don't really think too much more is necessary in this room other than just what TJ just said, right? Um, what is a more powerful um, message to folks who are thinking about um, eating habits and other things than um, the testimony and the, um, you know, just life experience of someone like TJ, right? Maybe a video, uh, maybe the um, photos that somebody like him produces, but this is the why, right? Why are egg gag laws coming to be? They're coming to be because there are organizations and people that are successful like TJ in documenting and reporting something and nothing changes consumer mm -hmm. behavior, right? We could sit here and say nobody's going to become a vegan because they watched a video. I don't know if that's true or not true, but we do know um, that nothing is changing eating habits more 
than the sort of expose. And don't take my word for it. Um, Purdue, right? Purdue, the industry, right, behind birds and other things, their study from 2012 um, showed that the single biggest factor in changing eating behavior are undercover studies, right? University studies have shown that people uh, are listening more to what is said by animal advocate groups about the food sources than the industry itself. Right? So why uh, have we seen ag gag laws? Well, they're part of a long lineage, right? I mean, these are part of anti-terrorism laws to begin with. They're part of food disparagement laws that have the date back decades, right? They didn't want you to talk bad about the food. Now with ag gag laws, they don't want you to talk about it at all, right? Um, that is the one. Why do we have them? Because we don't want people like PJ to be producing photos, telling stories, and sharing uh, with the world. Right? We saw aerial footage in the first panel today. Why are drone vans popping up? Right? Um, because they're the only way to document some of these um, you know, large waste pools. Where are drone vans uh, being introduced? The same state that egg egg vans are being introduced. Mm -hmm. right? uh, I have a, a pretty strong uh, civil liberties bent. Um, so I'm sympathetic to the uh, avoidance of government surveillance. Drones are an essential tool to seeing some of this stuff that we otherwise won't see, just like investigators are. Um, so ag gag laws, as their name implies, are just that, right? Efforts to gag uh, whistleblowing in the agricultural industry. Um, the what of ag gag, there's really kind of three forms that I will talk about, three forms of ag gag statute. Uh, the first, probably the, the least well known, and I think you know uh, what lawyers like to do is, as uh, TJ um, disparagingly referred to as our terminology and our words. Uh, you know, we fight over what things are called. Um, you know, uh, plenty of people don't think that the first category is even an ag gag statute. Uh, TJ would correctly tell us all it doesn't really matter. He would probably put an expletive in there. Um, that's that's right. But the, the first category that I do call an egg egg law is, is sort of sui generis, is, is unique to um, the state of Wyoming. The state of Wyoming recently enacted a law. Some folks say it's not an egg egg law. I don't really care. But what it does is interesting and it has the similar intent and focus. Um, this law um, passed just a over a month ago and signed into to law another emergency measure like Idaho. It was so important that it immediately took effect. Um, this law, um, among other things, criminalizes the documenting of research data on open lands. It's got no press at this point. Documenting research data on open lands. What does that mean? Um, no one really knows, but we know that they define open lands as anything that is not private. Um, so in the state of Wyoming, potentially, Taking photos to count bison in Yellowstone Park um, is now a crime. Right? Is that an enforceable crime? Is it is another matter? Um, but the state of Wyoming is very upset with one thing, and they've created a law to prevent it. The one thing they're very upset with at the moment is a nonprofit called Western Watersheds. It's a Western small nonprofit. And what Western Watersheds does uh, is very relevant to the first panel today. They document the harms of federal grazing, right? Uh, what happens when you have uh, animals on federal land. Well, they, they sort of focus on two things that happen. One is the complete elimination of ground cover uh, and the destruction of riparian ways. How do they document that? Through photos, right? They take photos sort of before and after grazing permits, before and after herds are moved into an area. Um, the website is powerful, shows photos of a valley, you know, dense with uh, um, erosion barriers and all sorts of beautiful plants. Um, you know, two years later, it looks like a desert that never had seen life. Um, they do that, and they do something else, which was the source of this law. They document, uh, they, have, they have scientists who take water quality samplings. Seems like something that the public would generally want. Um, the water quality samplings have shown that in waterways, uh, federal streams that are adjacent to large ranches in Wyoming, things that we would say are grass-fed beef, these are sort of model ranches in, in many ways. This, as, the, as that term would, would go, I guess. Um, the E. coli levels in many of those streams are 600 to 800 times the lawful limit. Um, how did they get that data? Uh, well, um, I represent the Western Watersheds Project. They have said they got it um, by using easements and going to public right-of-ways and testing the streams. The ranchers um, were not happy that this data was exposed, right? Photos of dead calves in waterways, not great. Um, e. coli rating is very high, not great. 
Um, the state of Wyoming was supposed to report this to the Department of Environmental Quality to the federal government. They haven't done that inexplicably. What they did do is turn over all of the GPS coordinates which you have to have for where the water sampling was taken. Um, and those G GPS coordinates were the basis for a civil lawsuit for trespass against Western Watersheds Project for exposing to the public E. coli um, problems with their waterways. And then, to take this step one step further, they lobbied for, passed, and as I just mentioned, enacted a law that made it a crime to do things on public lands and uh, relevant to Western Watersheds. They, ha they have a civil provision that says no government agency may use any data and must expunge from their records any data gained through trespass. So what that means is that if anyone decides, it's not, it doesn't have to be found through a court, anyone says, well, this was just through trespass, you shouldn't use it. Uh, I think it's absurd if you imagine what that meant for a law enforcement agency, right? If you trespassed into my yard intentionally or unintentionally and found a pit of dead children, um, presumably you would think that the police should use that information. Um, the state of Wyoming has said not if you were trespassing when you saw it. Um, and so the, the full scope and ramifications of the law remain to be seen, um, and for various reasons it, it's not so directed just at ag. Um, folks may not think it's an ag egg law, but it's a very scary statute that has just been enacted. The second type of um, gag or anti-whistleblowing statute that is, that is a recent vintage is a Missouri type law, these, these quick reporting statutes. So there are statutes that have come up that uh, criminalize essentially not reporting animal abuse fast enough. Right? It is a crime for you to have seen it and not to have said something fast enough. On its face, that sounds like a good law. Uh, I imagine that TJ could much better than I explain why that's problematic. But the short version is just what you might all expect, right? Um, if an organization, ALVF or another, spends the money and resources to get someone undercover, which is not easy, as TJ can attest, uh, and suffers the emotional, financial, and other harms that are related to getting in. If on his first day on the job, um, TJ sees someone punch a cow in the face, which he says, well, I think that's a crime. And you know, five minutes later, the cow is going to be dead regardless. In a state that enacts, like Missouri did, a quick reporting statute, TJ has to out himself, turn over his footage immediately. That's the end of the investigation. He saw somebody punch a cow. That's it. Done. Right? Um, he cannot continue to document sort of widespread abuses. He cannot continue to try to create a link between management. He cannot try to communicate or commu uh, make connections between other um, industries, the transportation of the animals. It's a one-time thing. right? Um, there is no opportunity to show systemic problems. And this is, of course, exactly what industry wants. Right? Every time there's an investigation, two things happen. Right? The first is they say this isn't true. Uh, notably, never has there been a defamation claim brought, much less a successful one. Right? But this is not true. What they're showing is out of context, not substantially true. And the second thing they say is, don't worry, we're going to fix it. How do they fix it? They fire low-paid workers. Right? And there's no skin off their back to um, fire three workers caught on uh, TJ's video and then proceed to business as usual and know that there are no longer investigators in there. That's probably they're not going to be the next source of investigation if they just get investigated this year. Right? Um, and so the quick reporting laws are one form. Um, the third form is the form that's slightly more familiar. And what I would say is that, is at the moment the dominant form, although perhaps not the dominant form in terms of what's being introduced, dominant in the sense that they are uh, the majority of state ag gag laws, either the old form or the new form. And that takes the form of prohibitions on recording and uh, deceptions or misrepresentation to gain access. Right? So this is um, the, the two statutes that are under federal legal review at the moment, a pending case in Utah and a pending case in Idaho uh, with a coalition of plaintiffs, both challenge these type of provisions. Uh, and I think with victories in those cases, will expand more broadly. But um, again, the, the core focus of these laws is to prohibit misrepresentations to gain access and to prohibit recording while you are lawfully present. Um, so a few things about those laws. I don't want to go um, too much into the, to the, the legal details of it. I'm uh, happy to answer questions about the, the legal theories. but. A few things to put those things in context, right? Because I think naturally some questions arise. Questions of um, is it really speech to record? And questions perhaps of 
um, is lying speech. And so just as a law conference, I will talk for a few minutes about law and then open up to questions. Um, so I apologize if you don't want to hear about law. Uh, I don't have as good a story as TJ, so we can talk about law. Um, but the, here, here's, here's the short version of how I conceptualize it. The Supreme Court has said that uh, above all else, the First Amendment, if it does nothing else, has to protect robust, uninhibited, wide open public debate on matters of concern. Right? So if it does nothing else, the entire purpose is to sort of facilitate this truth-seeking um, political discourse. That's why we have free speech. We have uncomfortable speech, we have ucky speech, we have speech that makes us feel um, uneasy or disgusted. It's because we think in our culture that that's where truth emerges from. Right? Um, my point here is actually that it's much more than communicative and expressive speech that's protected. There is some sort of pre-speech that we all implicitly, uh, and to a certain extent explicitly, recognize as speech. Along those lines would be um, my purchasing this pen, right, that made the beautiful notes that I wrote for this talk. Um, the purchasing of an ink cartridge for the pen. The purchasing or setting of a printing press's keys. Right, purchasing a printer, taxing a printing press. None of those things, like the transaction of spending money to buy spray paint or to buy ink, none of those things are actually speech. It's not, it's not communicative for me to walk into a store and buy a pen. But we can all feel fairly confident that if the government prohibited the purchase of paper, ink, or pens, uh, it would be problematic, right? even though that is just conduct. It would be problematic to say, that is pure conduct. It's conduct when I write a line until we see whether I cross it. Right? That the writing of a letter becomes speech, but not the, the antecedent movement of the hand. Um, there's no clear where place to draw the line, but it's clear that some pre-speech acts uh, are just as valuable as speech. Uh, and Justice Scalia himself, no great champion of civil liberties, uh, has once <laughs> said in the campaign, content, campaign finance context that in our system of sort of highly fragmented speech, you control any cog in the machine, you could break the whole apparatus, right? Because no one is printing, publishing, and doing it all themselves, right? You can control any one cog in the machine, you're gonna halt the whole apparatus. Well, that's essentially what the ag gang statutes do, right? They control the two primary cogs, the two primary entry points to investigations. What are those? Gaining entry by not saying that you work for PETA. Gaining entry uh, without saying you plan to record and put it on the internet, right? Um, and so, this sort of um, law is exactly what we're talking about with sort of pre-speech limitations. Right? Now, um, it's useful to sort of think about all of the First Amendment issues that arise um, through the lens of what is ultimately exposed. It's not hard to communicate that point to this audience after TJ's talk, but um, federal courts, including in the famous, Oprah Winfrey was sued, for those of you who don't know, for food disparagement in mm -hmm. Texas. Um, and you know, had to spend millions of dollars to defend herself. And the federal district court judge said, um, it would be difficult to imagine any topic of greater public concern and interest um, than the safety and well-being of the food we're eating. Right? So even setting aside the animal welfare and well-being issues, um, there is fairly set consensus that it's pretty important to know where our food came from and how it came to be. Uh, well, the public importance, the political salience of the topic is of direct relevance to the First Amendment. The Supreme Court has said speech on matters of public concern are entitled to the highest rung of speech protection. Right? So we're in that category and we're talking about lies and we're talking about recording. So to speak specifically to them, how do we, why would someone believe that lies, uh, right, sounds like a dirty word, lies would be protected, right? Why is it okay? when someone working for TJ is asked, um, do you have any affiliations with animal rights groups? Say no. Why is it all right when the Dateline investigator that's going into the child care facility to look for abuse is asked, um, are you a journalist? To say no. Um, why is that okay? Um, well, you don't have to take my word entirely. I mean, so this is somewhat easier than buying the pen, if you didn't like that example, because it is pure speech, right? It is something that TJ says or another person. So it's pure speech in the form of saying something and limiting it on the basis of, of its truth value, its true or its false, is a content-based restriction, so that's useful in a sort of doctrinal in the weed sense. 
Um, but I think the reason more generally that we care or we would think that it's protected is um, the Supreme Court has recognized in 2012, you may, you may remember a case called U.S. versus Alvin. In that case, the Supreme Court held that a guy lying about having won the Medal of Honor um, was entitled to, to not be prosecuted. So there was a crime, it was a federal crime to lie about having won the Medal of Honor. And this guy was a low-level politician, and I guess what uh, Justice Kennedy referred to as, quote, a pathetic attempt to gain credibility. Um, so he lied about having won the Medal of Honor. I don't know why. I guess that's just what people do. He said, you know, I'm a Medal of Honor winner, and anyway, I think, and he was like running for office on the local water board, anyway, vote for me. Um, and that's what he did. And came out, turns out he lied, and they prosecuted him. And the Supreme Court said, look, there's no value in this speech, right? And in fact, they repeated what they have said uh, almost unfailingly about uh, lies, which is that false statements interfere with the truth-seeking function of the First Amendment. There is nothing good about it. It's bad that you lie. You're, you're causing confusion, not truth. The First Amendment is about truth. Um, but nonetheless, you, know, you can't criminalize somebody just for lying. The limiting principle being, unless your lies cause harm. Right? And so that's really the rub of the ag gag cases. Is the lie to gain access? Is the lie saying you are not politically affiliated with an animal rights group? Is the lie saying you're not a journalist? Is the lie perhaps saying you didn't go to college? Or any of those lies, lies that uh, I tend to call journalistic misrepresentations to shorten. Right? We're not saying you lie about certificates or licenses, saying that you know how to use heavy equipment or have a medical license or something like that, but some sort of journalistic misrepresentation. Does that sort of lie fall outside of the purview of the First Amendment? Does it cause the harm of the ultimate exposure? Uh, and it might be the answer is easily no, right? That the undercover investigator does not cause the ultimate reputational harm that befalls an industry. Why? Because their, their unseemly, or in some cases, illegal conduct is the cause of the harm. The lie gets the person in, but you can't have damages for exposing truth, right? Uh, and so sort of a, a tangential, but I think central point is all of the lies that the Supreme Court has considered to date, this is thinking about reputational harm, defamation, lying about someone, calling them a cheat or whatever else, um, all of those things, and including lying and saying you've won military honors, all of those things have arisen in the context of the court being able to say, God, we hate lies. We really hate them and we hate liars, but, you know, we protect them because somebody's going to be afraid of telling the truth because they might end up saying something false and get prosecuted, right? So it's all prophylactic protection. The beauty of the ag cases is these are lies that actually have instrumental, if not inherent, value to truth, right? So all of the lies that the Supreme Court has considered prior to this are low-value lies. They impede truth. They're just speech that is not true, but we say, well, we've got to protect it, otherwise other people are going to be scared to talk. The lies in the ag gag context are actually lies to produce and generate truth. Right? There is no allegation, as I said before, that the lies are stimulating defamatory conduct. And if there is defamation, the person's actionable. Right? If TJ lies about what he saw, he can be sued. If his videos misrepresent what he saw and were staged, he can be sued. No one disputes that. Right? Nobody is disputing that. Um, so that's the lying portion. Recording, I don't know, maybe to this room it's easier, maybe it's not. Um, a lot of people, certainly the Idaho and Utah legislature, said things like um, recording just isn't speech. It's not speech. It has not to do with speech, right? Playing a video, sure, but recording it, um, no, that's not speech. And I guess, um, you know, what I would say to that is largely um, what I said at the beginning, that we recognize a large range of actions, conduct, if you will, prior to verbalizing something that has to be protected. We do not think it's okay to criminalize the printing press. <clears throat> and the, uh, you know, sort of go back in time and think about Upton Sinclair. Upton Sinclair, again, why do we have ag gag laws? People like Upton Sinclair led to, you know, their investigations led to the landmark legislation that we have today, right? Uh, when an investigation comes out in California, it leads to a referendum about what you can do with downed animals. Right? These things lead to legal changes. So imagine that Upton Sinclair had just went to a facility. A modern day Upton Sinclair walks into a slaughterhouse, chicken slaughterhouse like TJ described. He does nothing except watch, observe, and maybe he has a very good memory. Right? He takes it all in, 
um, the, the gritty details. He leaves the facility and he writes it, an account, an op-ed, a story, a book. Um, no one, I assume, not even the states in these cases, would say that the writing of that book um, can constitutionally be prescribed. You can't say he can't do that. Right? And so far as I can tell, no state will take the position that TJ or the modern day Upton Sinclair would be, could, could constitutionally be prohibited from taking notes. Right? So he had a notepad there. I mean, it would be very hard to do if you're on the assembly line every 1.7 seconds. <laughs> During your break, right, something else is not impeding your job function. Or even if it was, you were going to be fired for it. You took out your notepad, you jotted down, here's how many chickens I saw today, here's this terrible thing, <clears throat> or you try to jot a sketch. I don't think anyone thinks that that is not protected by the First Amendment, right? Why? His observations are legal. He's lawfully invited there. It's just he wants to memorialize his observations. He wants to make them part of his, uh, his more permanent record. Fine. Right? So then the question is, is it so much different to record than to use a notepad? Right? Is the rise of technology, is the existence of cheap, uh, relatively inexpensive, small, portable recording devices instead of a pen and paper, does that change the whole game? Suddenly it's not speech. Uh, my view is no, right? The self-authenticating nature of a video is good, not bad. I would rather have a video than TJ's memory, great as it is. Um, I would rather have a photo than his article in the Washington Post about what he saw, right? Uh, but that's not the way the state sees it, right? And why? Uh, you know, if a picture is worth a thousand words, um, you know, I've read that a video is worth a million downloads, right? Videos are easily transferred and immediately so. Right? They are damaging. They are hard to control. Um, and this is, this is exactly why they are so important to the speech portion of this challenge. Right? It is not the case that recording is something radically different than we have experienced in our history. It's something that memorializes your observations. Right? And when you think about why these laws passed, uh, there's, a, there's a, a representative in, in Idaho, Representative Pence. She said in the record, um, this law would have never surfaced except for the, uh, the conduct of uh, Mercy for Animals. Well, what was the conduct Representative Pence was referring to? Of course, it was an investigation of a dairy before, but that wasn't even what offended her. her. The previous line in her testimony was, they exposed the video, they exposed the abuse, people were fired, and if it had ended there, it would have been okay, and this law would have, quote, never surfaced. She said, but they went and they posted it on the internet. And that's when they crossed the ethical line for me, end quote. Um, so imagine, right, I mean, what she is upset about. The reason this law surfaced is because they went to the internet with it. Um, if that's where we're at, right, all we're saying is the sort of the memorialization of the things. This instead of pen and paper, the video, the public publication of it, um, that's what makes it <coughs> something that we should punish. Then I think it's pretty clear that the intent here is to, to curb speech and politically important speech. Um, I think I will probably uh, end there, and uh, I'm happy to take any specific questions. There's obviously lots of things, and, and, and leave time for questions with TJ. Thanks. Thanks. I mean, it doesn't, um, I, I guess the, the, the question is sort of if they're, if they're done quickly and, and secretly, can we still bring legal challenges? And the answer is, is definitely. I mean, they're still part of the public record. There's always a law that is signed into effect and there is something to challenge. Um, you know, most of these states, even these rural states, have uh, at least audio of the legislative debates. Mike Green has been very good at finding for me. So um, they are definitely. Um, susceptible to challenge, um, and you know, I think the two fronts, right, are just what you would expect. There's legal challenges, and then there's opportunities for um, repeal legislation, and maybe and someday affirmative legislation that provides more protections along the lines Professor Casuto was suggesting. But, but if you can imagine this in you know 
three parts. One is trying to beat them legally, another is trying to beat them legislatively, and then doing something affirmatively legislatively that would be helpful. Is there a certain amount of time? To challenge the statutes? Mm -hmm. I'm not in law. No, 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 yeah. Um, it's, it's sort of, uh, it's, it's dependent on somebody's injury. So, um, you know, anyone that had wanted to engage in an investigation that's precluded from doing so would have um, whatever the state tort statute of limitations is to bring a federal case. So, um, the short answer is kind of no. You, you, can, you can challenge these statutes as long as there's someone that suffers an injury. Thank you. Sure. Um, I was, this one's for Justin. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the admissibility of evidence that's obtained illegally, um, whether it's made illegal by AA or just something like simple criminal trespass, um, and the difference between you know evidence that may be obtained by a law enforcement officer in violation of the Fourth Amendment versus evidence obtained illegally by a non-law enforcement individual. Yeah, it's great. I, I, um, I like really, uh, one of my uh, vices is, is trashy lawyer shows. Uh, so if I, can't, <laughs> if I can't sleep, what I usually watch is uh, Suits. Um, they're very sharp dressed. <laughs> and in that, there was recently an episode where uh, uh, they were like, well, this evidence was illegally obtained. We can't use it. Just totally wrong. Uh, so so no, there's not, there's not, we, we don't have those limitations in civil litigation, right? Um, if the evidence is there and it's, it, you can authenticate it, then great. Right? I mean, and what makes it illegal is, is in fact, um, just the egg egg statute, right? I mean, um, TJ doing a video undercover, um, there's nothing illegal about that other than the egg egg statute itself, typically. Um, there's some consent laws, but most of those are being struck down on First Amendment grounds. Um, and the second part, you know, in the criminal investigations, uh, I'm sure TJ could tell you how this works in his, but there's no Fourth Amendment, there's no constitutional prohibition um, from using this sort of thing if they're not working for the state at the time they gathered the evidence, right? So unless they're a state actor um, at the time they're doing the investigation, we don't have those concerns and constraints on the state, so it can be used by the prosecutor. If a prosecutor sends in TJ to do it, it's a different matter. But if it's handed over to law enforcement, then there's no Fourth Amendment concern. Right. And, I mean, as you probably remember, I mean, law enforcement is actually um, entirely free to use deception themselves to gain right. video. Mm -hmm. So um, the simple fact that their state means the Fourth Amendment applies, it doesn't mean it's going to be suppressed. Right. I have two, really, one for Justin and, and one, I guess, to both of you guys. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a law student, I'm a retired cop. I work, I do some consulting work for some animal rescue groups, and that's kind of what brought me in, and today I'm leaving with uh, vegan mindset, believe it or not, which is not why I came here. If I saw somebody shake a dog or punch a horse, I'd take them to the ground in a heartbeat without thinking about it, but I'd have a steak for dinner. So that's just not right. So there's something to think about. But I guess the first question is, why don't we see like the videos that you obtained, TJ, and, and that kind of evidence in the media? Much like we see, you know, anti-smoking campaigns where I hear some guy talking through his voice box in the shower choking on water, and I think to myself, my God, that's disgusting. I don't smoke, but I can see how that could persuade somebody who does from smoking. Is there a reason that we don't see snippets from your videos or the evidence obtained by ALDF or PETA as media campaigns to let people know? Because the information's not out there for the public to see the treatment that these animals get to make their meal choices. Animal agriculture has the fourth largest lobby on Congress in the United States. Yes. Short answer. Okay. I mean, I'm sure you can speak yeah, no, more to that than I can. So the question at lunch, too, I mean, and my partial yeah. answer is getting these videos out is the way that we change sort of legislative Absolutely. parts and minds. I, I mean, I think, you know, if you went to any of the organizations' websites that are there, I think that you make a good point that a lot of times when they come out, it's, it's, it's hard. The, the sort of shelf life is shorter on the stories and... Um, so, you know, you're fighting between major media outlets and maybe, you know, whereas uh, another big story for the day might be on Fox, CNN, MSNBC, and whoever, maybe one of the three or four covers it, right, right? or even just the local syndicate. So I think there's less coverage, but it, it is out there, and I can tell you that, you know, the groups are doing their best, and that's part of TJ's job to make the, the sort of footprint of those um, larger. But it's a great point. The other, the other point I wanted to ask about was, you mentioned about like a statutory 
limitation on obtaining videos and then using the videos, New York State, the eavesdropping laws, would very specifically prohibit what you do for a living. And obviously as a cop, if I'm acting as an agent of the government, I can't do that <coughs> without a warrant. But you do it, and in New York, it says, you know, obtaining that, a conversation that you're not party to, and recording it by electronic means is a violation of the eavesdropping statute. Is that a problem, though, for any investigations that you do in New York? I mean, my, my quick answer, and I have the answer to what TJ had to say, is that um, I have not seen any of the investigations running afoul of the, the uh, generally applicable prohibition that you have to be a part of a conversation, because what we don't see is people leaving cameras. Um, I mean, that may be a tactic that could be employed, in states that don't have those statutes, but um, it's almost always that you are part of the conversation. Right. Mm -hmm. And the states that prohibit recording, um, even when you are a part of the conversation, so they're called like two-party consent states, so right. I can't record our conversation unless you consent also, Correct. those are generally being struck down. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, we're really talking about leaving a camera and not being there, and the right. states that prohibit that, um, that might actually hold up. It's a different, it's a different route because it's a generally applicable uh, it, it, it has not, um, in my career, come up in, in New York. You know that the the, the, uh, the party consent, you know, issue is not prohibited uh, anybody that I know from working in the state of New York thus far. Um, there, there are some states where you can't record audio because of that very issue. Washington State, for example, has has uh, uh, I think all party consent yeah, law there. Right, right. Um, so you know there there are certain states and, and we, we do we do investigations on a state by state basis. When ALDF we have uh, brilliant teams of lawyers who do uh, you know liability analysis on every state before we go in, right. so that we know down to the T what we can do and what we can't do and and exactly how to conduct a legal investigation. There. So I mean we take we take extra extra care to make sure that that everything that we do is is by the letter of the law, and we also you know push forward the, the, the way that we look at these laws and we try to challenge these laws, you know, and that's that's a whole other aspect of, of, you know, the work is to change even the ability to, to document more, you know, what, what's going on. It's, when, when you were referring to the, uh, just sort of as a tangent, when you were referring to uh, Arkansas and their, their reporting, you know, you have to report abuse within, what is it, 12 hours or 24 hours, whatever it is? Yeah, and, and they, they also, I mean, many of those states that, that, that say things like that also require that you um, demonstrate a pattern of abuse. And the, the time in which they say a pattern of abuse is demonstrated is far greater than the time in which you have to report abuse to begin with. And it's a complete logical dissonance. It just doesn't make sense. You know, so, and these things are, are you know, like, like you said, they're, they're, they're falling apart. You know, it's, it's not going to last, I don't think, especially when you have people behind these things. We have public, you know, you know, opinion is that animals shouldn't be abused, right? It's not criminal to report the abuse of an animal. You're standing up for someone. Just like if you see a dog get hit by a car, it's not abusive to take the dog to the vet. It's the same issue. So, I'm optimistic about that.